Thank you, David, and thank you all for joining and for inviting me to be a part of this gospel webinar tonight. I'd like to read with you, please, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, and we'll begin at verse 36. Luke 7 and 36, and we'll read through to the end of the chapter. It's a somewhat lengthy reading, but we're going to look at this story together. Luke 7, verse 36, and one of the Pharisees desired him, desired Jesus, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, invited him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. So Jesus resumes speaking. He says, There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. The verb tense for forgiven there is called a perfect tense. And some of the translations rightly indicate that what Jesus is saying to her is, Your, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. Same verb tense. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgives sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Same verb tense. It had already saved her. Go in peace. That's the reason I'm making that point about the verbs, and we'll get to it in due order. <clears throat> the subject I have before me from this passage is the cancel culture of heaven. The cancel culture of heaven. It's a buzzword, buzz phrase right now, but actors, athletes, businesses, CEOs, politicians, even world leaders are getting canceled. Not even Dr. Seuss was able to avoid it. Maybe it's happened to you. You shared your opinion, or an old post from 10 years ago resurfaced. And now you've been canceled. It's happening everywhere, every day. Jobs are being lost. Accounts are being suspended. Even revered historical figures who lived centuries ago are being canceled in one way or another, and they're not even here to be able to defend themselves. But it's hard to know what's more troubling, the cause for cancellation or the character of those who are doing it. Many of this world's Cancelers, as opposed to counselors, many of this world's cancelers don't have the highest standards of morality to begin with, and yet they opine on the morality or lack of it among other people. Now, sadly, it's getting out of control, and some have uh, stated already. It can be one strike and you're out. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because that's the cancel culture of this world. There's no mercy. There's no grace. There's no forgiveness. It's just you made a mistake and you're done. 
Now, heaven's cancel culture is much different, thankfully. God is not interested in canceling people. God is interested in canceling people's sins. God is interested in canceling yours. And we see Jesus doing just that with this woman that we read about in Luke chapter 7. Now, just to set up the story a little bit, so we're familiar with what's going on, the background is that Jesus has been invited to the home of a Pharisee, Simon the Pharisee. And during that meal, during dinner, a woman from the city barges in. Everybody knew who she was. She was a, a sinful woman. And she comes in uninvited and makes her way to where Jesus is reclining during the meal. In that culture, they would eat with in a reclining position. Their feet would be up. And so that's how she was able to be standing at the Lord's feet, at the Savior's feet. And she's standing there and she's crying. Tears are coming down her face. Her tears are landing on his feet. She takes her hair down, which was not to be done. It was a bit of a scandalous thing to be done, uh, to do in public. She takes her hair down. She opens up this jar of, of ointment, this perfumed oil, pours it on his feet. And, and she's making quite a scene. And Simon sees all of this. And, and he says, this, this is not right. To be done to a, a man in public, these, these actions were were." over the top scandalous and so in his mind he says and and by the way jesus is a rabbi no rabbi would allow this to be done and in his mind he says if this man were a prophet he would know what kind of woman this was this what kind of woman this is and he certainly wouldn't be letting her touch him in this way in other words she should be canceled from the dinner she'd already been canceled by society and Simon is very willing to cancel her from the dinner and remove her from his presence. But uh, Jesus is not about to have any of it. In fact, Jesus shows he is a prophet. He's more than a prophet. First, he's going to show that he's a prophet because he can read. He could read uh, Simon's mind and speak to something that was on his mind. And then, of course, forgive the woman's sins and show that he's more than a prophet. He's actually God manifest in flesh. He has the authority to do it. Now, he addresses Simon with this short story in the middle of the bigger story. And that's really what I want to focus on, uh, the verses 41 and 42. So Jesus says, Simon, I have something to tell you. I have something to say to you. Simon's just thinking now. He's looking at this woman. He's thinking, this man, if he were a prophet, he would know this woman is a sinner. He would not be letting her do what she's doing. The next thing Simon hears is Jesus say, Simon, I have something to tell you. He goes, Oh, go ahead, master. Speak. And then he says in verse 41, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors, two people that owed him money. One owed 500 pence, the other owed 50. And when neither one of them had anything to pay, he frankly forgave both of them. Which of the two will love him the most? So that's the story. And there are three things about this story that I want to emphasize. For this gospel webinar. First of all, first of all, we all, like these debtors in the short story Jesus told, we all owe God something. We all owe God something. Now, the mere fact that we've been created tells us that we owe God, our creator, something, and we have clothes on our back and we have roofs over our heads. We have food on the table. We have people around us who love us. God has been very good to us, and we should be willing to admit that, that even at the very basic level, God is good. He is the creator. We owe him because of the fact that he made us, and we're accountable to him because he is the creator. But we all owe God for something else. We have a debt of sin. We have a debt of sin. That sin is a debt that we owe is clear from Simon saying in his mind, this woman's a sinner. And then Jesus telling him a story right away about two people that have a debt. Sin is a debt. Also, the conclusion of the story where we read about her sins that were many were forgiven. 
also support the speaking about sin. And we all have sinned. You have sinned. I have sinned. We all owe God something. Jesus tells a story about two people that have debts. One of them had a debt of 500. One of them had a debt of 50. But both of them had something they owed to the creditor. And so do you. So do I. Now, Simon may have been prepared to admit that he was a sinner, too. If you had really, had, you had really focused in on Simon and asked him the question, do you believe that you have ever broken God's law? Have you ever sinned? He may have, he may have been prepared to say that he had. But I'm sure that he would say that this woman in his house right now, doing what she was doing to Jesus, was a much bigger sinner than he was. Simon thought he was a great deal better than her. her. I mean, her innocence was gone. Her purity was lost. Her character was stained. But Simon, he was a religious man. He was a respectable man. He was a moral man. How could a Pharisee be anything else? Well, that's probably the idea behind the 500 and the 50 in the story that Jesus tells. So somebody owes five, somebody owes 50 pence to the creditor, but somebody else owes 500. That's 10 times as much. And I imagine that he maybe thinks Simon will maybe view himself as the one that owes 50, but this woman is the one that owes 500. She owes 10 times as much as he, she's 10 times the sinner that he is. Maybe you think something like that. If you were pressed about your own moral character, you might be willing to admit, yes, I've, I've done things that I shouldn't do. I've broken God's laws. I, I, I look at even the Ten Commandments and say, yes, I've stolen, I've cheated, I've told a lie, I've dishonored my parents. I've... And you might be willing to say, I'm guilty. But then right away we say, but I know this other person. I'll tell you what, when it, they are ten times the sinner that I am. Let me ask you this. Does that matter? Does it matter if you can find someone that's ten times the sinner that you are if you're still a sinner? And by the way, the Bible tells us all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all guilty. It's best to just admit it. We all owe God something. Sin is a debt that we owe to God. And God will hold us accountable for every single sin. Every person on earth is going to stand before God someday and give an account for their life. You will, and I will. I will not answer for your sin. You will not answer for mine. But mind you, you have a debt. We all owe God something. And the reason why this debt is so important is because if you die with this debt of sin, you will miss heaven. You will miss heaven. Jesus said, if you die in your sins where I'm going, heaven, you can't come. You must have this sin debt canceled. And that's a part of heaven's cancel culture. That's what God wants to do. He doesn't, he's not interested in canceling you. He wants to cancel your sin. Just like Jesus did for this woman. So the first thing is, we all owe God something. Number two, number two, none of us can pay God anything. When it comes to the debt of our sin, none of us have the currency that is required to pay off any of our sin debt. So look at verse 42. Jesus, Jesus has set up the story. They both have a debt. And then he says, and when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. They had nothing. They had nothing. They didn't have one pence, let alone 40 or 400. They had, they had nothing. And at that moment, does it really matter if the debt is 50 or 500 if you don't have anything to pay it off with? I mean, it matters in one sense. God is just. And we're going to give an account for every one of our sins. But as far as what you can do to contribute to the removal of the debt, what difference does it make if you owe 50 or 500 if you have zero that, that can be applied to it? Doesn't matter. Now, both of those amounts Jesus gives are small in, in the currency of the day. 
and, and the Lord was not emphasizing the amount of their debt so much as a comparison of the two in their own minds. Uh, when he wanted to tell people what the absolute amount of the of our debt was, uh, he did it in another parable, or in a parable called the parable of the man who owed ten thousand talents, the equivalent of tens of millions of dollars. And have you ever? I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about how many sins you really have committed, because we're not very good bookkeepers with our own sins. We tend to be very good bookkeepers. When it comes to other people's sins against us, right? Well, they did this and they said this and they have not, right? We keep up with that. How about our own ledger? How's it looking? Oh, I think we would be absolutely frightened to see what the total balance was. Back in the days when, uh, before there was online banking, the only way you got your credit card statement was in the mail. Some people may actually still get them in the mail. Yeah, I remember going out to the mailbox and seeing the dreaded envelope. Here it is. It's a credit card statement that record that has a record of every single debt that was accumulated through the month. And you'd open it up. And sometimes the package was pretty thick. It meant it was not a good month. Right. And every single transaction is on there. Date. Place of transaction. Dollar amount. Date. Place of transaction, dollar amount, line upon line upon line, and on and on it would go. And then at the bottom, you'd see the subtotal. And you'd flip the page. And there's another page. And there may be multiple pages. And then at the very bottom of all of the pages, the, the, the staggering total. And I can't believe I accumulated this much debt in just one month. Imagine what our statement would look like before God. Every thought that was sinful, date, place, description, every sinful act, every lie, date, location, nature of the debt, imagine it all added up, not over a month or a year, but a lifetime. The amount would be absolutely staggering. And here's the problem. We can't go to heaven with that debt of sin, and we don't have anything we can pay it off with. You can't find it in the Bible where it says, if you do good things, you eliminate part of your debt of sin. You, can't, you cannot find that in the Bible. It's, it's not there. Our good works don't pay for our sin debts. Back to Jesus' story. One owed 50. The other owed 500, but neither of them had anything to pay. They didn't have what it takes. Jesus, Jesus doesn't say they were just a bit short on the debt and he forgave them the rest. He forgave them the whole thing because neither one of them had anything to put toward the debt. And neither do we. Going to church won't pay off the debt of your sins. I hope that's enough to tell you that there's a reason why people go to church. It's not because they're trying to pay off their sin debt. It's because they love the Lord Jesus who saved them and they want to serve him and they want to obey his word. Going to church doesn't pay off the debt of our sins. Praying won't pay them down. Giving to other people won't eliminate the debt. Being remorseful won't take care of the debt. Determining to live differently. Doing as many good deeds as I can think to do will not drive down the debt one cent. Those are all good things to do, but they don't take care of sin's debt. None of us can pay God anything. Now here is where the here is why the gospel is good news because the word gospel means good news. You say, "Well, I haven't heard much. I've heard a lot of bad news," and that's true. Here's why it's good news. The good news is that a payment has been made already. A payment for sin has been made already. A payment for all sin has been made already. And that payment that was made, God received as satisfactory to clear a sinner's debt and cancel it altogether. When did that happen? That happened when God's son, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, was hanging on a cross. 
he gave his life. And just before he gave up his spirit, Jesus said these words, it is finished. It is finished. In fact, it can be translated and maybe should be translated paid in full. It is paid in full, paid entirely. What was Jesus doing on the cross? He was making a payment for sin. It was a transaction on account of sinners. That's why the hymn says Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. So even though we all owe God something, and none of us can pay God anything, number three, we can all be forgiven of everything. We can all, all of us, be forgiven of everything. Now look at verse 42. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. He frankly forgave them both. He looks at the one, it's time, it's time to, uh, for the debt to be collected. All right, where's the 50 pence? I don't have it. How much do you have? Five, 10, 50? Nothing. I have zero. Nothing. Yeah. How much do you owe? Time to pay. You owe 500. Yeah, I owe 500. How much do you have? Nothing. Nothing. That's right. You know what he does? He cancels their debt. He cancels their debt. Heavens cancel culture. I like it. See, God doesn't cancel people's, God doesn't cancel people. He cancels people's sins. And Jesus didn't cancel this sinful woman. He canceled her sins. And God can cancel your debt because Christ paid sin's price at the cross. What is required for you then? What is required for me? I did the sinning. He paid the debt at the cross. You know what I have to do? I have to come with my debts. I have to come with my with my debt of sin to Christ. And you know what he will do? He will cancel it. He will cancel it because a transaction has already been made. And you need you need to pardon the phrase cash in on it. Imagine that Bill Gates, one of the world's richest people, obviously, announced that he was coming to your city. When he came, he would be in a certain location for maybe two or three hours, and that all who came to him with their debts, he would cancel them. Would you go? Would you go? Just come with proof of proof of your debts, and he will pay them off. Amazing thing is, he probably could <laughs> with a lot of people, not the whole world's population, but with a lot of people. Would you go? I'll tell you one thing. I'd figure out a way to get there. I'd be looking for. Uh, how much flights uh, were up to New Jersey. I'd be on my way with my paperwork in hand and all that was needed, right? Christ is making an offer to you in the gospel about a far more important type of debt, and it is the debt of your sin. See, you can go to heaven and you can have a mortgage and still go to heaven, okay? You can owe money on your school loans and you can still go to heaven. But listen, if you have the debt of your sin, you can't be in heaven. You must have debt cancellation. Your sin must be canceled. Your debt must be cleared. And it can because Christ died for our sins on the cross. You see, that's, that's almost too good to be true. Yet it is true. That's why the gospel is good news. Christ came from heaven, died on the cross, paid the price for our sins, endured God's wrath that our sins deserve. He took it on himself. And now he says to you, come to me, come unto me. All you that are laboring, heavily burdened, I'll give you rest. Come. Why wouldn't you come to him right now with all of your sins? And he will clear them. He will cancel them because he made a payment on the cross that God has already accepted. Now, some people usually hear such a message like this and say, oh, then I can, you know, I, that sounds too good to be true. I come, I, I have forgiveness of my sins, and then I can live however I want. Really? Is that what this woman did? You don't understand the gospel. This woman whose sins were many were forgiven, and she loved the Lord Jesus in return. 
And that's, I, I, we don't want to miss this point. This is one of the main points of the story, and we can't miss it. Look at verse 42 then. Tell me, he asked Simon, tell me, which of them will love him the most? They've both been forgiven, right? One owed 50, one owed 500. They've both been forgiven. He says, which of the two will love him the most? Simon says, I suppose the one that he forgave most. And Jesus says to him, you have rightly judged. Good job, Simon. You got the answer right. You've been paying attention. He says, see this woman here? See what she's doing to me? You're the, you're the host. Usually the guests come in, the host washes their feet in that culture, that time period. You didn't wash my feet. She's washing my feet with, her, with tears coming from her face. You didn't uh, provide anointing oil. That was often done. You didn't provide any anointing oil for me. This woman opened up a jar of ointment, poured the whole thing out on my feet. She's, she, you didn't kiss, give me the kiss the typical greeting that would be received. This woman, from the time she came in, hasn't stopped kissing me. She's actually kissing my feet. What's the point? She's been forgiven of so much. And that's why she loves me the way that she does. That's why I make the point later about the verb tenses. Jesus doesn't say, because she did all of these things, her sins have now been forgiven. No. The way to have your sins forgiven is not do lots of nice things for Jesus. He's telling Simon the reason why she's done all these things is because she's already been forgiven of so much. And maybe he's challenging Simon, do you really love me? Do you really love me? You didn't do any of these things for me, but she has. Right? So any of us, who have had our sins canceled, we know, we know why this woman was doing what she was doing. We love the Lord Jesus. He saved us. He canceled the debt of our sin. We, we want to serve him. We want to do what his word says because we love the man that saved us, that took away our sin, guaranteeing us a place with God in heaven. We love the Lord because our sins, which were many, he forgave. He canceled. We all owe God something. None of us can pay God anything. Our good works don't pay off our sins. But we can all be forgiven of everything. Yes, everything that we've ever done, that is ever on our record, he will clear. Paul wrote this to Christians in Colossae in a letter. This is true of Christians in Colossae and Midland Park and Denver, North Carolina, no matter where we live or when we've lived, Paul said this. He said, he made you alive with him, with Christ, having forgiven you all your transgressions. Having forgiven you all transgressions. This has already happened. You've been forgiven of all your sins your transgressions. So a Christian is someone whose debt of sin is completely forgiven. All sin canceled. I like heaven's cancel culture. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of the cancel culture of this world. One strike and you're out. But I like heaven's cancel culture where there's grace, where there's mercy, where there's forgiveness. And if God, is, by the way, if God has been that way with us, we certainly ought to be that way with one another. While cancel culture proponents are presently scrubbing names from buildings and removing them from our history books, Christ is recording names in his book called the, the Book of Life, even called the Lamb's Book of Life, because it was the blood of the Lamb who was slain that was the basis for us getting into that book. All those who come to Christ with their debt of sins, he will clear, he will he will forgive. He will cancel our debt and put us into his book. And listen, he promises that your name, he will never blot out. He will be there permanently. So tonight, come to Christ. Come with all of your debts, with your debt of sin. Admit your guilt. We are guilty before God. 
We don't get to blame other people for our sins. We have sinned. You have sinned. And you have a debt of sin far larger than maybe you care to admit. But Christ died for sins on the cross. The Bible says Christ died for our sins. So come to him with your debt. Trust in God's son. He will never turn you away. He will never, he will never cancel you. He will save you. He will save you now if you will trust in him. And we pray that you will.